today we're going to start our sermon in the book of Judges, chapter 21, start with verse 25. So if you got your Bibles, put it in turn to Judges, chapter 21, verse 25. The book of Judges is, is one of the most interesting books of the Bible. It, it is a book all about repeating a mistake. Over and over and over again, the Israelites repeat a mistake. And at the end of the book, it tells us why that happened. It actually gives us the theme of the book. Let's look at that today. Judges, chapter 21, verse 25 says, Those days Israel had no king. Everyone did as he saw fit. Let's go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for this day that you have made. We thank you for the multiple blessings you have given us. And, and as we just come into your service today, we pray that this word just swell in our hearts today and that you help impact our lives. Please give me the words of wisdom to explain it accurately. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As I said, of the book of Judges, if, if you just take the last half of this verse, which says, everyone did as he saw fit. Or as in maybe another translation you might have, everybody did what was right in his own eyes. You get the theme of the book. Now I want to put before you today is, is simply this. I believe that there is any passage, any, any verse of the Bible that really explains our generation today, that explains who we are, that, that, that tries to give an accurate description of, of what is going on in our society. I believe it's it. So I believe that the book of Judges for the American evangelism today is a must-read book. So I got to thinking, why is this so today? This whole week, or I shouldn't say this week, these past couple days, and as the sermon is coming together, I got to thinking why this is true. Because normally I could just sum it up, and usually I just kind of toss away, well, everybody just doesn't believe in the standard anymore. And when we don't believe in the standard anymore, everybody just does go to what they, they, they honestly see is right in their own eyes. And there is some truth to that, but, but I got to think about something more. When I started thinking about what's going on in society, and all the pictures up here represent something that we're struggling with, from, from morality to where we get our information about who's telling our truth, about what do we do about our history, about the institutions that we have. I mean, I want you to think about this. From everything in our society, we, we ask a fundamental question, don't we? Who do you trust? Does anybody here struggle with who do we, we trust in this world today? I mean, when we start talking about modern stuff today, mask or no mask, who do you trust? Who do you turn to to get the most accurate information? Vaccine, no vaccine, who do you trust? Who do you go to? World, world events, when you start looking at things in politics, which, which news station do you really trust? Which, which outlet do you trust? When you start talking about, okay, well, we're questioning things in history, and we're looking back on history, and we got questions about what happened with our forefathers, what sources do you trust? Do you start to see a common theme? I believe we have a generation today that has risen up that does not know who or what to trust. And when it comes to religion, they have the same problem. If you start studying statistics today, if you start studying um, the different things, the different studies that come out with, almost all of them say something very universal. I don't know who to trust. And that includes the institutions we all were raised with, whether it comes to our government, or the federal, state, or local state, whether it is our educational systems, whether it is the grade schools, or high schools, or colleges, or even the textbooks in, in academia who have come out, whether it has, listen to this one closely, the church. Who do we turn to? Who do we trust? How do we know that the information that we are absorbing is accurate? One of the things I kind of thought about this week, we are swimming in a, a time where information is so accessible. You know, you know, this little device right here, our forefathers wouldn't have known what to do with it. This little device right here can carry on it hundreds of books. This little device here can look up hundreds of information, thousands of information, millions of information, 
It can absorb podcasts. It can absorb articles. It can absorb blogs. It can absorb books. It can absorb all this stuff. And I don't know which one of them to trust. We have all the information, but no foundation underneath to believe we're being told the truth. That has relayed over into people not knowing if they can actually trust the Bible or not. I don't believe that we're in a society that actually does not believe that there's a supernatural, that does not believe that there is some form of a God, that does not believe that there's something out there. I believe their, their generation has risen up like Paul on Mars Hill. I come to proclaim to you the unknown God because they believe there's something out there, but they have a statue to an unknown God they do not understand and they do not know. And the church has not given them answers for it. So for the next few weeks, we're going to start doing that. If our society is swimming in doubt, if our society does not know who or what to trust, we have got to give them the, the, the tools, the means to understand this is how you can know. And we're going to start with the Word. Because if the world doesn't believe the Word, it doesn't matter what else the church does. Look, guys, the church is involved in all kinds of things. We can do projects, we can do goodwill, we can go out and get food, water, clothing, and all that. But if we're not giving out the word, and if the world doesn't believe the word, and if the world doesn't understand the world, it's all for nothing. Legitimately, it's for nothing. So we've got to rebuild a broken foundation. If the world needs to be confident that what we have, what we're preaching is the truth, then we've got to give them the truth. So let's start with it. We're going to put stuff to the test. Do you realize right now that when we're talking about how do I know something is true, you've got to put it to the test. There's a universal truth that has happened in every generation. Since the Garden of Eden, Satan's plan has been to simply make people doubt the Word of God. It's unbelievable when you stop and think about it that Satan has had the same game plan for at least 6,000 years that has not changed. And the church has had thousands of years to examine this, and we still act like we don't know what he's going to do. He has, it's plain. Look at Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. What he does with Adam and Eve, he does with us today, he is doing to a generation today, and we are acting like we're being blindsided by this, but it's right here in the Word. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say, you must not eat from any tree in the garden? If you highlight, if you underline, if you circle in your Bible, I want you to highlight the first half of his sentence. Did God really say? Those four little words that we're looking at here, it's the same question he makes every generation since Adam and Eve, which is every generation that's ever existed, asks the same question. He is asking that question. He is whispering it into the ears of our friends, of our family, of our sons, of our daughters, of our husbands, of our wives, as our mothers, our fathers, our cousins, our brothers, our sisters, our neighbors, our friends, our co-workers, even your enemies. Those four little words are being whispered into the ears of people. Did God really say? We're still wrestling with that. You know, there's a group of scholars that meet on a regular basis. Go to the Jesus Seminar that sits there and what they do is vote on whether Jesus really said something in the Gospels. Can I repeat that in case you missed it? There is a group of scholars, people who should know better, who vote, who are 2,000 years removed since the last 10 has struck the Word of God, who are voting, who never heard Jesus speak, who never met Him, who do not know any of the witnesses that met him, but they are voting on, did Jesus really say? Geniuses. <coughs> I want us to understand that as we start to look about how God 
gave us the word that God used humans to reveal his truth. There's lots of ways I guess God could have produced the word, but in his ultimate wisdom, this is how he decided to do it. Peter describes this in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21. For prophecy never had its origin in the will of man. Notice this, what he's saying here, prophecy. This is prophecy is not the foretelling of the future, necessarily. Prophecy is any word that comes from God. It can be about the future, it can be about the past, it can be about the present. Whatever the message is that God's given. He says, prophecy, the revealed will of God, never came from man's imagination. No. But men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Peter, Paul, Matthew, Luke, James, Jude, John, Moses, Daniel, Jeremiah, Isaiah, David, going down the line. They, they did not come up with this on their own. But the scripture is saying, and, and we don't always understand the process, and we're not meant to always understand the process, but the process was that the Holy Spirit inspired, led, directed them to speak something. Meaning, when we read the works of Paul, we're not reading the thoughts of Paul, we're reading the works of God. What God has revealed to Paul, to pen and paper. That's what we're reading. This is why we don't call it the word of the church. This is why we don't call it the word of Christians. This is not why we call it the word of the apostles. What we call it is the word of God, because we're trying to accurately explain who this originated from. Problem is, there's counterfeits. There's counterfeits all over. In, in my office back here, I had a counterfeit. I wish I would have brought it out now. I wasn't thinking. It's called the Book of Mormon. It is a counterfeit. There's lots of other counterfeits out there, whether it would be the Quran, whether it would be some of the other texts that's out there of other religions. There's counterfeits out there that, that claim to be in the Word of God. So what do you do to make sure you don't have a counterfeit? You test it. Since there are counterfeits, God wants us to put it to the test. Do you ever realize that, the, that this is just four examples I'm going to pull from that tells us to put it to the test? You know, when you have the real thing, you're not afraid of the test. You're not going to think about my academic career. You, you want to know the only time I was afraid to take tests? The only time that I was afraid to take tests was when I knew it was going to prove me to be a fraud. Where I was going to say, oh, I believe I got this information. And I go and the test says, you did not have the information. When I did have the information and I did learn it and I did know it. And I was learning what the professor was trying to teach me or the teacher was trying to teach me. I wasn't afraid of the test. Because the test was going to prove that I knew something. I was only afraid of the test when... I didn't know the material. The only people who are afraid of something being put to the test is when they know what they're proclaiming is false. When you have the truth, you're not worried about a test. You welcome it. God welcome the test. Now here's how he did it. Now this first of all, so the Israelites were put were to put the prophets to a test. You realize that? Deuteronomy chapter 18, 14 through 22. Deuteronomy, chapter 18, start with verse 14. This is the test. The nations you will dispose, listen to those who practice sorcery and divination. That's the counterfeit, sorcery and divination. But as for you, the Lord your God has not permitted you to do so. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own brothers. You must listen to him. For this is what you ask of the Lord, your God at war. On the day of the assembly, when you said, Let us not hear the voice of the Lord our God, nor see this great fire any more, or we will die. The Lord said to me, What they say is good. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers. I will put my words in their, his mouth, and he will tell them everything I command him. If anyone does not listen to my words, that prophet speaks in my name, I myself will call him into account. By a prophet who presumes to speak in my name anything I have not commanded him to say, or a prophet who speaks in the name of other gods, must be put to death. Here is the text. 
what they say, does it come true? Are they proclaiming in the name of the real God or the false God? There is a test here. You may say to yourself, how can we know when a message has not been spoken by the Lord? If what a prophet, notice, if what a prophet proclaims in the name of the Lord does not take place or come true, that message uh, the Lord has not spoken. That a prophet has spoken presumptuously. Do not be afraid of him. This happened all the time in Israel, by the way. All kinds of false prophets got up and proclaimed things that God never said, and their prophecy never came true. That's why we dismiss them. That's why we don't hear of them. That's why we don't know them. They're gone. They're erased from history. The true prophet is one who speaks the truth, and it comes true. By the way, I want you to understand that Jesus did not rebuke an honest test from a true seeker. Mark 12, 28-34 is in the midst of a bunch of people trying falsely to disprove Jesus. Jesus gets very upset with them because they're intent. They're, 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 they were trying to see if something was true. They were trying to prove something false that was true because they didn't care about the truth. When you cared about the truth, when you really came to seek the truth, Jesus took time with you. Jesus was okay with you doing this. And when you look at Matthew chapter 12, he has somebody who comes here who puts it to the test because he wants to see if Jesus truly is the Son of God. He puts a fair and honest test with a fair and honest response. Jesus doesn't get upset with him. In fact, Jesus praises him. Look at this. Matthew chapter 12, starting with verse uh, uh, 28. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. Noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer. Notice the intent of his heart. He's hearing good answers. He's now intent to see, is this the truth? He asked them of all the commandments, which is the most important. This is a fair question that anyone with a basic understanding of the Old Testament could, uh, could answer. He's seeing whether Jesus is sincere. The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Now, notice, if you compare and contrast this with the other people, whenever Jesus gave an answer, they yet never praised him, they never said it was correct, they never went, because they were trying to discredit him. This man is trying to see if he's the truth. What's that, teacher? The man replied. So he's respectful. He admits that Jesus gave a good answer. You're right, saying that God is one and there is no other but him. To love him with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and, with, and love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all the burnt offerings and sacrifices. This guy is, is not only saying Jesus is right. He's going on to tell him why. Tell people around him why he's right. He is, he is acknowledging the truth. Jesus said that he answered, saw that he answered him correctly. He said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And from then, no one dared ask any more questions. Jesus wasn't upset with him because this guy was truly seeking. When we're truly seeking and we bring things to the best, Jesus is not upset. In fact, we even see that when the apostles were put to the test, the scripture calls them noble. Look, the Bereans were noble for their examination. Acts chapter 17, verses 10 through 15, the noble Bereans, people who search the scriptures. As soon as it was night, the brother sent Paul and Silas away to Berea. On arriving there, they went to the Jewish synagogues. Now the Bereans were of more noble characters than the Thessalonians, for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. They took the apostle, Paul is preaching from the Old Testament, they go back, they research, they see that what Paul is saying is true. Um, many of the Jews believed, and also did a number of prominent Greek women and many Greek men. What we're looking at here, in this path, well, let me go on. When the Jews of Thessalonica learned that Paul was preaching the word of Berea, the word of God Berea, they went there too, agitating the crowds and stirring them up. The brothers immediately sent Paul to the coast, but Silas and Timothy stayed at Berea. The men who escorted Paul brought him to Athens, and they left and with the instructions of Silas and Timothy to join him as soon as possible. When you look at the compare and contrast the two, once it's there and they examine the word, when they hear it, they believe it, 
they're overjoyed. The other group is just trying to disprove something. They travel across land and sea. You ever notice this? You don't believe something. They travel land and sea. They're just trying to disprove something. The difference between the two. Those who see it, who hear it, who believe it. Those who just have a hard heart, let's turn it off. A true test is seeking the truth. In fact, we are told to test the Spirit. We are commanded to test the spirits today. 1 John chapter 4, 1 through 3. Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirit to see whether they are from God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. This is how you know and recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus has come in the flesh is from God. But every spirit that is not from uh, but that, that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming, and even now is already in the world. What we see here is we are told there are Antichrists, there are false prophets, the church is still to examine today. I, I, I tell you the truth, you will never make me mad by going back into the Word and saying, is what Jason saying today the truth? Examining it, testing it, proving it. He will make me upset because you're saying, well, I'm just going to tune out whatever he says, I'm going to believe it anyways. I like that. My, my goal is to teach you how to think and how to process the Word of God so you can know it for yourself, so that you are not caught off by condemnation. There's a reason why I give you that little piece of paper in your bulletin. You go back and you test, and you, you weigh, and you see if the sermon's accurate or not. Counterfeits cannot survive a test. That's why I don't, I, I'm not worried about the Word of God being put to the test, because it's true. The test is fair, the test is honest, the test is always going to prove the Word of God to be true. The counterfeits are worried. So how do we test it? It's a great question. Another name for the book of the Bible is canon. It means standard. If you ever hear me referring to a canon during a sermon, I'm not talking about that thing you shoot at your enemies, okay? I'm talking about a standard. There is a standard by which things are measured by. That's how you know whether things are true or not. You have to put things to a test. When the Bible was compiled together, it was compared to a standard. It was put to the test. From the first century, the church saw that the writings of the apostles as scriptures. You realize that? You want to know? I can give you biblical evidence of that. This is so cool. Look over first, or excuse me, Second Peter again, chapter three. Second Peter chapter three, starting with verse fourteen. This is the the, the viewpoint the church had about the writings they were receiving. So then, dear friends, since we are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and peace with Him. Bear in mind that our Lord's patience bears uh, means uh, salvation, just as our dear brother Paul also wrote to you with the wisdom that God gave him. Paul, excuse me, Peter is acknowledging the writings of Paul. What's he say about it? He writes the same way in this letter, speaking in them of these matters. His letters contain some things that are hard to understand, which ignorant and unstable people distort, as they do the other scriptures to their own destruction. You notice what he's doing? He's elevating, excuse me, he's elevating Paul's writings to other scriptures found in the Bible that they would have already recognized the Jewish Old Testament, the Jewish, what they call the Tanakh. He says, Paul's writings measure to that standard. From the first century, from the moment that those scriptures were being written, the church is recognizing the power and the authority of God. Now I want you to understand something. The church did not determine the standards. This is, this is where we're going to have to really pay close attention. The good thing and bad thing about history is a lot of people like listening to it. The bad part about history is people don't actually pay attention. They hear, but they don't pay attention. So the argument always becomes, well, there was counsel that determined which books of the Bible were real books and which were, were false. But the, the church doesn't determine this stuff. So let's talk about this process. Number one, let's remember, 
God, not men, selected the authors. When we look at the authors, the church didn't vote on, okay, we won't poll the right this up. That's what happens today. If we were going to select the writings that was going to, if I said, we, we really need to put together something that really explains our ideas, we're going to vote on who gets to write it. Who are the, the standard barriers, right? Man didn't do that. In fact, if you go back into the Gospels, Jesus told the, the apostles, basically, you know, he, to, to share his words, whatever they said here on earth has been said in heaven, that basically, that he was giving his stamp of approval onto the disciples. That's why they were given the Holy Spirit. God selected them, not man. And this was not decided by a council. The church always recognized the authority of God. So, I brought some stuff up here today. These are some of my history books. This one's a really neat one. This is uh, the, the works of Eusebius. You can go online and get this today. Eusebius was a church historian uh, in the 300s. Um, writes, really, he write, really writes before a lot of the these councils meet. But one of the things when you start reading guys like Eusebius, and you start reading guys like Justin Martyr, and you read some of the early church fathers, and you, here's something that is very interesting. Before any church council sat down and said, this is the canon, the church already recognized that we have historical documentation that before an official statement was made in Christianity, we can go back and document that the, the, the books of the Bible we have today are found in other lists of other people saying this is scripture. We can go back really to the first century and we can find other Christian people quoting from the scriptures. We can find people who are, who are talking about this. We can find people who are making lists and say these are the words that we know. These are the teachings we know that come from Paul. These are the things that we know come from Peter. These are the things that we know come from Matthew, from Luke. These are the scriptures the church already believes. It, it wasn't a vote to determine which ones were there. What the council was doing, if you go back and study history, is we had all these books that were laid out before us. Some of these were very bad false doctrine books from a group called the Gnostics. And what the Gnostics would do is, and this is very unethical, but they did it anyways, I would write a piece of paper, I'd write a book, and I'd say, well, I'm Paul. This is Paul writing this book. Paul didn't write that, but Jason wrote that. He said, it's unethical. They did it anyways. And they started circulating, so they had to sit down and say, how do we get rid of these books we know are false? Keep them out of the church. How do we get these books that some church accept and some don't? How do we, how do we get them into to, to know which one's which and which one's different? How do we take the books that everybody already knows? It already accepts as scripture. This is the key. That already accept as scripture. And let people know that we know that these are good, solid books. This is what actually happened. And when we start looking at this, this is what I want you to understand. When a canon was completed, the books had to meet strict standards. In other words, so they had all these books here. And they say, we know that these are doctrinal books that are false doctrine, that come from false prophets. We know. Not a shadow of a doubt. Not a question. We know that these are false. We know that these are some that the church does use, but we really don't know for sure where they date back from. In order for a book to be accepted, it had to be something that already matched pure church doctrine. That's something that was contradictory. What the apostles taught. It had to be something that they could date back to an apostle, or to an apostle's associate. It has to be, I mean, there was these standards that they met. So if they had this book, it may have been a book that most of Christianity liked. One third of the church may have liked this one book that was claimed to be written by Barnabas. And the church is like, can we know for sure it dates back to Barnabas? No, we can't. We can't accept it. We know that this one does, or, or this one did, or Whatever. So when you go back, they had this already believed. They had, and by the way, you say, how do we know this? You've got to study church history. We, once again, we have this stuff documented. This is the cool thing about this. 
We have early church fathers from as early as the 1st and 2nd century who were either direct disciples of the disciples or a disciple of someone who was a disciple. So either a first or second generation testimony that these teachings were true. It's documented. It means we can go back and put these things to the test. If you ever question why a certain book is in there, all you have to do is find books like Eusebius or Justin Martyr or any of the other historical documents out there and see why they give the testimony. This book here, this, this introduction to the New Testament, this is another cool one. This, this actually, if you don't want to read old historical ones, what this does is it, to help you understand the rest of the books of the Bible, it tells you who wrote it and what the testimony from church history was about it. So in a book like, like this one, New evidence that demands a verdict, but Josh McDowell does the same thing. They go back and say, this is, this is the lineage. Or you got books like this, archaeology and Bible history, that, that connect the evidence. That says, this is how you know. Guys, when we go back and we put these things to the test, it's not like we don't have a world of information to go back and, and examine this on. We do. Our first test is found in how, is studying how the Bible was put together. Were they right? We can do that today. We can actually go back with the historical documentation, with the information we have from, from archaeology and from people who study this. We have all this information. We have a world of information that God has given us that most of the church is ignorant on. I don't mean it in a negative way. I mean they just don't know what exists. That is out there. To compare and contrast and say, yes, we have a firm foundation to believe that the books we have were the ones that God intended. By the way, if God really intended for another book to be added into it, do you not think that the creator of heaven and earth who created the stars and the planets with a spoken word could not keep a simple documentation alive in history? If it was meant to be included, why would it be lost in history? So let's test, test the canon. If we're going to test if the books of the Bible are in a canon, can they pass certain tests? There should be certain tests that they should be able to pass. Number one, are they historically accurate? We go back again and we can compare it to books like this. This is the archaeology book. And there are so many things that are dug up in the history. When we go back and compare and contrast, we can look. There's, a, there's an author that really helps us with this. Luke. Look at Luke chapter 1, 1 through 4. Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who were first eyewitnesses and servants of the word. Therefore, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, it seems good also to me to write an orderly account for you most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know certainly of the things that have been taught. When you study Luke's writings, Luke is so detailed, he is so minute in certain points. When he starts talking about certain things, that Luke has actually been put to the Bible multiple times. And what comes out is he's extremely historically accurate. Remember when I was talking to you about the, the Book of Mormon? You know what they found out when they compared Joseph Smith's writings of history? That it was pure fiction. That the things he claimed happened historically in North and Central America were fictional. See, when you compare the truth with the false, you start seeing. You just got to, you just got to know what to compare with. Is it historically accurate? Number two, was prophecy proven? Oh, this is a great one. Isaiah 44, 28. Over a hundred years before a guy named Cyrus was born, Isaiah, we can document when these things are written. There's ways of studying this. Isaiah writes this. Isaiah 44, starting with verse 28. Who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd, and will accomplish all that I please? He will save Jerusalem, let it be rebuilt, and the temple let its foundations be laid. Guys, what you got to do, there's enough Old Testament prophecy to 
put to the test to see, did it come true? That's what God's test was, by the way. That's not Jason's test. That was God's test. God's test was if a prophet claims to prophesy about something and it does not come true, throw it out. If it does, it is true. Isaiah is in the canon for a reason because his prophecies have been proven true consistently. Is it consistent? Does the Bible read as one book or telling many stories? When you look, we have 66 different books. Over 30 authors of the Bible. Two different languages. Separated by 1,500 years. If it's really the Word of God, it would be consistent. What would Jesus say? Matthew chapter 5, start with 17. When he came on earth, he said this. Then I think that I've come to abolish the law of the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. What do you notice about Jesus' ministry when you really compare it with the Old Testament? You see how it fits like a puzzle. And it becomes completed. What we see time and time again when you start putting these things, these are just some tests you put together. It fits. It's biblical. So some say, well, I just don't have faith in the translations. That's a great one. I want to first of all remember this. The Bible gave grave warnings about not adding to or taking away from the Word of God. This is just one of them. Revelation chapter 22, 18 through 19. I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of the book. If anyone who adds anything to them, God will add to him the plagues described in the book. If anyone takes away the words from this book of prophecy, God will take away from him his share of the tree of life in the holy city, which are described in this book. In other words, whenever we look at a translation of the Bible, this is the NIV right here, 1984 copy. I don't like the newer version, this is the 84 copy. The people who, who wrote this together, do you think they didn't know these warnings? The people who translated them? Sure they did. So what about it? Since the Bible is in a different language, can we be sure our translations are giving us the truth? We do put a lot of trust in people who translate the word, they're giving us the truth. That's a fair question. Before anybody thinks that that's an unfair question, it's an extremely fair question. Number one, we have the text in the Hebrew and the Greek to check. Back in my office, I've got a Hebrew and a, book, a Bible, and I have a um, Greek Bible. The accuracy rate, uh, one of my professors once told me that through the linguistic studies and everything, even though we don't have an original copy of the original epistles, we can put it back with 99.9% .9 accuracy. It's from people who study this stuff. So we have the Bible that was intended. By the way, if you want to put it to the test, the Bible might say, put it to the test. Great. Glad you asked that. Then see scrolls. Book of Isaiah. 1,000 years apart. Copies. 1,000 years apart. 95% word for word accurate. The only thing that was different was some spelling of some names. It's been proven. There is an accuracy rate when you start studying this, and we have 25,000 copies of ancient texts of the Bible compared with. We have the Greek and Hebrew Bible. By the way, we have multiple translations to choose from. Go to, there's a couple of resources you can go to. But, you can go to BibleGateway.com, or you can also use one of the Bible apps. You can find several translations. When I say several, I'm trying to count up in my mind. I, I'd say at least 10 to 15, if not 20 or more. If this comes out of my life. These are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. These are, these are translations I, I regularly use, six different translations that I compare with. I got much more in my office. I didn't feel like bringing them all out. Whenever I studied Word, I studied from multiple translations. You know why? To get the gist, to get the original feel. Because one translation may not give you that feel because they all translate different. The NIV is a word, is a thought-to-thought -thought translation. The New American Standard, English Standard is a word-for-word -word translation. It's trying to do the same thing. It's trying, some of them are written in modern language, some of them are harder languages. Some are written on a 12th or 11th grade reading level. Some are on a 5th or 6th grade reading level. 
Multiple translations mean you can compare, you can contrast, you can see the truth. We also have tools that we can use. Do you guys know that there's actually computer programs now that will actually translate the word for you? You don't have to know a thing about the Greek or Hebrew. But back in my office, once again, I've got several books on the what the original words mean. Here's what I'm trying to say. Since translations can be tested, we can have confidence in what we read. When I, when I study from the Word, I don't worry about whether I have an accurate translation because there's multiple of them. You can compare and contrast. They're not all written by the same people. They're not all written by the same people that have the same theological background. They're not all written by people with the same agendas or the same bias. They know the warnings such as the one that you read in Revelation and know to even change one word <clears throat> is to damn them to hell for all of eternity. It's not <clears throat> losing money. It's not making your name become mud, which it would. It wouldn't be because you couldn't be put on a blacklist and no theology Bulk company, no, the college, would, yeah, it's true. It's that you would be damned for all of eternity. What would that, why would you risk that over a word, over a bias? You wouldn't. But even so, it could be compared and contrasted. If you don't have faith in the translation you have right now, come see me. I can give you a bunch more to check it out with. Here's the point of all this. We know God doesn't mind being put to the test because he's always going to be proven true. We know how the canon was put together and we can test the canon. We can test the translations. We can put everything to the test. We can have faith that what we are reading comes from God since it can be tested. Once we find the truth, we must follow it. Society doesn't know where to turn to for truth. It's in the Word. It can be trusted. It can be put to the test. Once you see it, are you willing to accept it? Today, the truth is here. If you believe that Jesus is Christ, so living God, if you believe that to be true, as the Scripture says, you need to repent of your sins, be baptized, give them your sins, and give them the Holy Spirit. To that, why you still have a chance. To make that decision, we become a singer of a song.